Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what you know about benchmark? Uh-huh. They're speaking the facts that you wanna hear. They rep a jersey, the vision is clear. Diamonds glisten like a chandelier. You know what I'm here for, like Michelle Lynch. It clutch time, we do not flinch. Real brothers, we do not switch. Hit home runs with the right pitch. Who run the city? Ooh. What to do when they hating on you? I feel like Kobe 2010. Taking an L, all I need is a win. This is his business, you know how they go. They playing the seats, now it's time to grow. Tune in now, gotta be in the know. Showtime, bitch, my butter blow. We Woo. know. Welcome back. It's another episode of the Bitch Mob Podcast. We have here tonight with us a special guest, Cedric Henderson, assistant coach right now at Christian Brothers University. Played at Memphis from 1993 to 97, over 1,600 points, six overall in scoring, made it to the NCAA 20 twice, five seasons in the NBA, all rookie second team. How are you doing? Thank you for hopping on with us. Oh man, thank you, man. I'm 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 doing good, man. I'm very blessed, man. Just glad to be around this game still and hanging out here lately in these weird times, you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's been definitely crazy. Something I want to ask right off the bat. So you're coaching at Christian Brothers University. How is that? And how is it also coaching your son at the same time? Like I can't imagine how fun that is. <laughs> Well, you know, I coached him when he was at junior college at Southwest, and um, that was an amazing experience. You know, um, you know, you always just kind of used to being his father and watch him through high school and things like that. So, you know, I never thought about the day I was going to get a chance to coach him, and uh, <laughs> it was cool. You know, and he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't uh, a knucklehead like you know what I'm saying. You know, I've, sometimes you can be dad father situations where they kind of talking back or whatever, but he was really a great great. Player, you know, a, co- a very coachable guy. Um, he listened to listened to me, and we we had great conversations over the games. You know, uh, in fact, some days he even had some better points than I had, and better views of what what was going on. So that was a, definitely one of the, the highlights of my young co- coaching career, uh, being able to coach him and uh, see him doing so well at the next level where he is now. Yeah, I can't. Like I said, I don't have kids yet, but I know that's <laughs> got to be that's got to be dope, especially to be able to see your son having success too. It's a lot of players that their children aren't really that good. They don't really turn out. <laughs> it to happens. Be that good. It happens, and, and we're I'm and I'm very happy and I'm blessed about it. So I mean, but he works hard, man. My my son, I give him all the credit in the world. I mean, he does he doesn't take it for granted. That's one thing I like about him. He doesn't just you know think it's going to happen. He knows he has to put in the work. So that what makes him a great guy. That's good. That's good. You mentioned so, dealing with COVID, right? I mean, how's everything going with COVID? I know coaching during COVID must be must be different, all right? I mean, it's not like anything we've ever, we've ever seen before. So, how has that been for you? Well, it really shows it. You no, know, it shows you who loves this game. You know, because of the, all the protocols we have to go through now, and if you're really dedicated, you know, and want to sacrifice to have a season, you have to do a lot of sacrificing as far as you know, paying attention to who you hang around, what are you doing. You know, because you, if you get tested positive, I mean, you know, you might lose a whole week or two. I mean, you see it all the way around the country, what's going on. Uh, it's been it's been it's been difficult, but I give credit to the team. They have been very dedicated to the season and dedicated to playing and doing all the right things. So it's that's been a great blessing about this whole situation is seeing young men kind of grow up and make those sacrifices because you know how hard it is. I mean, you're in college, man. You want to go hang out with your boys and and do all the fun things that college <laughs> life brings. <laughs> but um, it's been fun. It's been, it's been very cool. And uh, I'm very humbled to be around a great group, of guys, great group of guys. Yeah, I mean, you even see it with NBA players. It's, it's hard yeah. for some of them to follow the protocol. So I can't imagine <laughs> yeah. being in college during this time. And you can't – you just got to go to practice and go to your, your dorm. Like, literally, that's pretty much – it, yeah, that's no your life. Parties, <laughs> no, no, you can't go to any Greek events, like nothing. It's just school, gym. Like, I can't imagine. <laughs> but starting back with you, like, where did your love for basketball start? 
And it started when I was watching uh, a couple of family members of mine who played in high school, you know, um, just being around those guys, you know, uh, watching them play. So, you know, I started falling in love with the game, you know, and, and I wasn't very good at it, but I, you know, I was just, you know, neighborhood guy, you know, who wanted to play basketball, be like his bigger cousins and stuff like that. And, um, and then one summer I just kind of grew kind of tall and that helped a little bit, but uh, you know, uh, you know, and then when you realize, you know, I mean, I always just had the fun and joy of it, just competing every day. You know, though, that's how I met a lot of my friends, you know, that was just like my outlet from getting away from the house. You know, I grew up in a single mom home, you know, so, uh, so you know, I, my sister was like nine years older than me. So I really was like, right, I gotta go do something, you know, so I uh, started getting into some sports with them. So, and then before I knew it, I just kind of fell in love with the game of basketball. That's definitely a major key. Me and Greg met through basketball. Like that's how we <laughs> met. So a right, lot of right. my close tight knit friends is from basketball. Like I literally think, except for one of my groomsmen and my wedding was because of basketball. Man, and that's what you I – I mean, if you were to look at it, man, some of your best teammates are your best friends, you know. Yeah. Uh, I look at all the guys who I still talk to and stay in contact with and were former teammates that I played with and, and had some good times, you know. And, and it's something about that, that, that locker room com camaraderie we have, you know, going through those journeys, those seasons, and, you know, all that crazy stuff we probably did we shouldn't have been doing. But, you know, <laughs> that's how we experience life, you know, and – and uh, it ended up being cool. You know, you become friends. You know, I think me and the coach was talking about it uh, not too long ago in practice. Just like, hey, you know, 20 years from now, we want to hear from these guys saying, hey, you know, coach, you know, we had a great time. We still talk to the guys, you know, they, you know, they married, they fathers, you know. So that's what you're doing in this thing. You know, you're kind of grooming young men to be something different. And I, and I still talk to some of my old coaches. So it's, it's just like a good thing of passing, passing down knowledge, you know, every day. I mean, that's, that's incredible. I mean, and the mentorship is, is amazing that you get to do as a coach. I, 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 on a much smaller level, I coach AAU and it's not the same. I don't, I don't groom men, you know, I don't, it's not the same <laughs> you, level, right? But right. I mean, but it, just being around the guys, like the, com the camaraderie, it, it's like those are those guys are still my best friends to this day. So it, it's, it's definitely a lot of fun. I can speak to that too. I mean, you mentioned one summer you grew, you just not really tall and things changed, right? Like uh, your yeah. friends changed playing <laughs> basketball. What I want to know, too, is, like, I, we spoke to Brevin Knight, um, mm -hmm. and he mentioned growing up that he wasn't really doing a lot of the training that you see a lot of these young guys doing now with the cone drills and all the trainers, like, having five or six <laughs> different trainers. You know, like, for you, like, how did you enhance your game? Was it playing a lot, or is it working out? Or were you were you working out and with, with trainers? Well, you know, honestly, man, is I, I mean, in our days, that's what it was. It was playing, man. Like, we played nonstop basketball, you know. It wasn't, like – hey, let's go get, find a trainer. First of all, we couldn't afford a trainer. And that's, that's what would be so funny now when I hear a kid who in the eighth grade, oh, I'm going to see my trainer. I got a strength coach. I'm sitting like, yo, like, who paying for that? You know what I'm saying? But that's 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 where we are in, in today's society. But, you know, growing up, man, I just played the game. You know, I was playing on the milk crate, you know, in the backyard. You know, that's how we hoop. You know, you had to spray the, spray the yard down from all the mud just so you wouldn't have too much dust out there. So, you know, that's how we play. And then as I got older, you know, you start playing around community centers. You know, that was a big thing for me, you know, uh, one no trainer. But just let's, let's be honest, though, technology wasn't, you know, there to give us all those luxuries that we have now. It was just like, you know, if I wanted to play a video game with a friend, I had to get on my bike and ride probably two blocks and bring my joystick to play with them. You know, now you can sit at home, never see each other and play online all night long. I mean, I watch my son. I'd be like, yo, who are you talking to? He's like, oh, I'm online playing video games. I'm like, oh. OK, you know, so it's a whole different it's a whole different love. But like growing up, man, I just played the game. all the time. I mean, but I played all sports, though. You know, I was you know, I was into football, I was into basketball, I was into baseball. I mean, I don't know. Y'all know about kickball, but hey, that was big around here. We were playing kickball in the park all day long, you know, just just being a young man, you know, just having fun, you know, and that's that's all we did. So you just mentioned you played multiple sports. And, yes, me and Greg definitely know about kickball. That's some of the best <laughs> games. Especially summertime, summer camp. Yes, sir. <laughs> Anytime. Yo, what y'all want to play today? Kickball, kickball, dodgeball. Those were all always the top answers. Nobody knows better about that rubber ball, right? <laughs> exactly. 
How did you end up choosing basketball? So you played football, you played baseball. How do you end up choosing basketball as the sport you ended up turning into your career? Uh, well, football taught me a lesson that I was too tall. So when he was short dudes kind of hit me kind of hard. So I was like, all right, this ain't for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, as I got better at basketball, you know, uh, it, honestly, like my, I didn't start really getting good at it. Like middle school was still seventh through ninth for me. So like my eighth grade year, uh, Coach Jones, who was at Bellevue Junior High, just put, he's like, yo, dude, we're we going to put you on the floor. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, and that's when I started competing, kind of organized basketball. Uh, then my ninth grade year, I just kind of got serious about it because I, I'm, I was one of those competitive kids who just wanted it to be good at something. You know, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to put all my energy in it. And then it kind of took off. Uh, then that summer, I met Bobby Dodd, who was the Y. Uh, back in the day, it was a summer league with the Y, and uh, I got with got with him as a going into my tenth grade year, and just kind of had one of those summers, and uh, that's when I knew I was like I, I, can, I can play this game, and end up going to East High School, and, and the story goes from there. You mentioned that you know it was about tenth grade. You realize, hey, I can actually do this in high school. How did you end up choosing Memphis? You went to high school, I believe, in the state. You right. stay in the state. How did you end up going through that process and choosing there? And why did you end up staying home? Well, I was going to leave, and my mom wanted me to go to Vanderbilt. I mean, I was blessed to have a lot of opportunities to go to a lot of different schools. Um, and, you know, moms was all about that education. So when Vanderbilt came to the house, it was like, hey, this is where you're going. This is what you're doing. And I was like, okay, I'm sold on it. And then Anthony Hardaway, who was still at Memphis, and we were we not the same player, but we was in the same positions, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I was like, oh, man, I want to play because, you know, I was a McDonald's All-American. So all these other coaches are saying, you know, hey, you come in, you might play right away. Uh, but when he declared for the NBA, that made my choice. Like, I, I can play for home because I've always been a Memphis fan. Who doesn't want to play in front of their hometown? Like, let's be real honest. Um, I grew up watching the Tigers you know, from the Andre Turners to the Elliot Perry's to the Keith Lee's and William Befford, uh, you know, just going to the Miss Op Coliseum and watching a lot of those great games, you know, it was like, hey, one day maybe, you know, <laughs> you know, like maybe I get there one day, maybe. And then when the opportunity came, I was just like, okay, this this might be it. And um, I think having a discussion with my mom was like, you know, she wanted me to make sure I was close to home. You know, either I was going to Nashville, which is Vanderbilt, it was only two hours away, or – come to Memphis so when I chose Memphis I think it was the greatest choice because I got to play in front of my fan, friends my families um, they got to see me grow up but grow up until a young man you know right before their eyes and, and it was so much great support I mean like I don't know if y'all know our record but when we played at the pyramid the tomb of doom we didn't really lose there <laughs> so <Yeah. you> know, <laughs> we weren't really lose there so it was just a great atmosphere and it was great to be you know a little hometown hero so you know, and if you look at all the other schools, the North Carolinas, the the Kansas, you see a lot of local guys trying to play for those schools because they, you know, they grew up watching that team. So that was one of the bigger reasons why I wanted to come to Memphis. Yeah, I definitely could say it's a different feeling when you're able to play at home in front of your friends and family. And as you said, the biggest part with that, too, is like they get to see you not only mature as a player, but as a man. And that's mm -hmm. one of the, the best things because it's kind of hard. Some people obviously do it well, but it's kind of hard to do that across the country. It's it really like, is. Yeah. It could really be a challenge for for a lot of I mean, players. You see, to, you see a lot that. of young kids. I mean, like, it's tough for them not being – never being away from home, you know. So, I mean, the luxury of being able to say, you know, I'm going home, it means getting moms cooking today. You know, that was definitely one of the biggest perks. to know. But, you know, and I still got to see the world. You know, that was the other thing, you know. Mm -hmm. We, we, we were able to go play Cincinnati. We went to Hawaii, went to Australia, you know, during my college career. So I got to go travel and see the world, and and um, and I'm still able to come back home. So it was a, it was just a big, great blessing to be able to play here. Hey, we, you, know, you mentioned that something that stood out to me right away, too, and you mentioned it almost like, like nonchalant, like it's no big deal. You said you were a McDonald's All-American. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's something that 1% of people get to say, right? What was that right. like? experience getting to play in the all you play in the all-american game like what right who, who was with you like how was that 
Talk me well, I, I was I was with the Jerry Stackhouse, the Rashid Wallace, the Randy Livingston crew. I mean, it was 93 class. I thought was pretty good. I mean, if you go back and look at it and look it up, you'll see. I think everybody except probably two or three guys didn't make it to the NBA on that roster. Uh, Charles O'Bannon, you, you know, Ed O'Bannon, my younger brother, was on the team. Jock Vaughn. I mean, uh, a lot of guys was on that roster. And that was the, really the first time I got to be able to see – you know, like the top, top talent all, all at once. You know, you usually go to a school, you might see two guys who can really play. But to see it all at once was like, man, it was crazy. And then the crazy part was we got to do it here in Memphis. So that, that made it even sweeter because I got to play the McDonald's All-American game right here in Memphis. And it was it was crazy, man. I mean, like, I mean, I, that, that could be one of the greatest moments of my life, being able to be on a platform that be in front of your friends and, and then being saying, hey, I'm coming to Memphis, too. I mean, it was crazy uh, at that time. I enjoyed every moment of that, man. I mean, like, um, I think the craziest thing was when we were playing and we were doing a dunk contest at the field house in Memphis. Uh, I was so nervous because, you know, everybody was just like, yeah, saying, come on, man, you got to do something crazy. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. It's like, So it, it was a great feeling, though. It was it was real cool, though, man, you know, and – that was the first time I ever really got to see that I can compete with, with some of the best guys. You know, I had a decent little game, you know, uh, that year in that, in that game too. Yeah, I'm listen. I, I, I lost some time <laughs> before the game started. I, I'm, I watched um, the Knicks game back in 97. where We had 23 points in the garden and it was oh, yeah. straight pull up jump shot work. Just straight <laughs> half step, pull up. I'm like, this guy's skill. Like, what, what do you think about, uh, the way the game's trended today. Like, I feel like watching you, I feel like I'm watching like, a lot of guys, a lot of threes and fours. I feel like you could have played a little four today. Um, right. I feel like you could have played today, like with that, with that game. Like, how, how do you feel about the game and the way it's kind of transitioned from what you were playing? Well, well, just put it this way. If you shot 23s, that was as a team. Now you got guys shooting 23s by itself. So it's a whole, whole different philosophy of what's going on. Uh, I mean, in today's game, I honestly, because I was a, a decent athlete and the way they play so free up and down the floor, I think I could have played in this game in this era because, you know, if you're a decent athlete and you can run, you can pretty much put up some you know, good numbers. Um, now, I think the mid-range game is kind of disappearing, but the great ones still know what it is, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at Kawhi Leonard, he, he'll, he'll mid-range you all night long. Uh, DeMarco Rosen, when he gets on fire, he'll mid-range you all night long. You know, you got Anthony Davis. I mean, come on. And then KD, oh, my God. You know, like how you stop a seven-footer for, you know, a 15-footer when he want to. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the game has changed so much. But uh, I think if I was in this era where it's, it's not as physical now, I mean, you got to understand, too. I mean, like back then, you know, NBA stood for no babies allowed, and they meant that. You know, like you went to the hole, you was going to get knocked off. Mm -hmm. um, now it might you might get kicked out of the game suspended for two years if you hit them some too hard, you know, <laughs> like flop. It's sad that we had to put a rule in the game that says, hey, we got to start calling text for flopping. You know, like it's getting to that point, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like today I because like, I coach today's game. So I like I like I, it's an offensive minded game. I was a, I would have enjoyed it because. You know, I like defense, so you don't see too many lockdown defenders as, as usual, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I, I definitely would have probably – mean, I tell my mom, like, you could have had me, like, 10 years later. Yeah, yeah. I could have – I think I could have <laughs> – I think I could have been all right mm -hmm. in this day's lane. Run, the way they running up and down – I mean, like, it scores mm -hmm. what, like, 135? <laughs> yep. Like, all-star yep. game. So, Makes you know. so yeah. much money in today's game. <laughs> oh well, we ain't going. That. That's a whole. You know, we, Charles Barkley <laughs> says that every night on TNT, he said, "Man, my mama had me too soon." I yep. mean, you got guys. I mean, you know, like the minimal. I mean, but that's the blessing of the NBA too. I mean, I can't mm -hmm. knock it. I mean, that's the blessing. That's what guys like the Larry Birds to the Magic Johnson to the, all these Michael Jordans and Kobe. They paved that way for us mm -hmm. to benefit and reap out of that. And we should respect that. You know, like when I see a guy, they, I think they were talking about. Um, What's the center from Utah? Um, Gobert. Gobert. Gobert, right. You know, everybody's like, oh, my God. I was like, but that's the market, though. His, yep. The market says, hey, we got to pay him this money. And I'm like, hey, get it, man. 
Get yep. it because you're never gonna in your life is gonna ever make that type of money again, and you can't get mad at him for doing yep. what he's doing. I mean, you know, I mean, I looked, I remember when Mike Conley signed his hundred million dollar contract. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh my god, Mike Conley. I was like, his numbers say, hey, yep. <laughs> his numbers say. I mean, he was in the top ten in point guards coming at that time. So, you yep. know, the money is crazy, but that's what we had in today's society. You know, we, Credit to, like you said, the old guys who did what they supposed to do. That's it. That's it. You know? yeah, mentioning that is like, I always find it funny. If the team offers me $300 million, <laughs> I'm supposed to be like, yo, I don't deserve that. I'm not going to take it. No. <laughs> <laughs> like, why are they getting mad at Rudy? Like, yeah, no, you, yeah. <laughs> am it's I going like, to come no, back to them? Like, hey. No. You know, I'm not really that. averaging 20 right now. No. <laughs> oh, my counter offer, my counter offer is only like 10 million. That's it. That's all I need. No, <laughs> but it's like real talk. I mean, like, you know, you're not, you'd be a fool. You know, like I was, I think, um, who, who bet it on himself? I can't think of the player's name. Somebody bet it on himself and he ended up kind of getting hurt. And you sitting there like, man, you left a hundred million dollars on the table. No, bro, no. I mean, mm. like you said, you're never going to earn that type of money in your life doing anything else. So just take it, you know, and I, and it's no knock to them. I mean, like I tell people all day, I said, y'all worried about the player's contract, right? I just think about this. The player's contract, you got guys making 40 million a year. They're getting paid 40 million a year. So imagine what these people who are owning the team is mm. making a year. Mm. Well, we don't even want to go in that conversation, right? You right. know, like that's the realistic part of it. You know, those guys, they're able to pay somebody, you know, two hundred, three hundred million dollar contract. Trust me, they're making double that. You know, they're not, mm-hmm. they're not, they're not, they're not dumb people. So they definitely making double whatever they give it out. So the NBA is, has thrived. Uh, I think Stern, when he came into the game, I think he did a great job as a commissioner at making this thing global. I mean, I remember when he got the TV deal to go global across the world. You know, we we start airing, you know, all over across all across the world, like in places we never reached, and then we were reaping the benefits of that. You know, so you, hey, man, hands off to the NBA. It's a great machine, and can It's like getting mad at Tom Brady for winning number seven, right? <laughs> you can't get mad at that, right? You gotta respect. Hey, it. That's it. <laughs> that's a t- that's a touchy subject. Uh, yeah, I, 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 oh, who, 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 who was a Kansas City fan? Which one of you guys? Come on now. Uh, one of my counterparts, I won't say who on the show, uh, to my <laughs> right, <laughs> was saying <laughs> he was saying a couple weeks before the game that Brady was washed. So, Amen. the people, our followers on Instagram are having a good time with Greg. Uh, oh, with man. Brady getting that seven. Hey, man, hey, it happens, man. It happens. Hey, you, you should thank Matthews for that one, too. I think he woke up asleep in Giants, you know. Um, Why did you do that? I do not know, and it, and it was ugly from then on. It's so crazy. The, the game went the exact opposite of the way I thought it was going to go because I didn't think the offensive end, the offensive line of the Chiefs were going to were going to struggle that much. I thought that they could kind of scheme around it and make plays regardless. And football is a simple sport. You block. If you can't block, you can't play. And if you can't run the ball, you can't play. And the Chiefs didn't do either of those two things, so they got they got beat up real good. And you know Brady's. He's a goat. There's nothing really like else like yeah. you know? I mean, I, now I don't give it all the credit to Brady. I'm not going to say no. That. Right. I think, I think that defense last year, that defense was great last year. You just had a guy named, uh, what's that guy named in New Orleans now? Played at Florida State. Uh, what's the quarterback? You know, oh, James, 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 James. Yeah. Who kept throwing seven interceptions every game. And now you got a quarterback that knows how to manage. Yeah, that clock and that team. That's that's the difference, and that and that's a credit to guys. I try to tell all my young guys. I said, listen, it's not too many times. There's only one rookie I ever known won a championship and an MVP, and his name was Magic Johnson, right? Now name me another one. Any sport, there's not too many. Usually that team is a veteran team, right? That's why LeBron is so good at what he does. I mean, he's not he's he's seen so much. You know, he didn't seen it all, so you know he knows how to. You know, dissect the thing. That's why when Michael Jordan did what he did, it's still unbelievable. Because like, here's a guy who took two years off, and they come back and do another three peat. Like, wow. like wow, why, 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 what happened? Like, how you do that? But that's because he's, you know, he's serious about what he does. You know, I, that's why you respect champions. You know, 
Mm-hmm. Going back to college, so four years at Memphis, mm-hmm. we did our research. Y'all barely lost with Memphis. A lot of success with Memphis. What were some of your fondest memories uh, playing playing there outside of, of, like you said, playing in front of friends and family? Man, it was so many. I mean, we, we played some great teams, you know. Um, one, of, one of the greater teams, you know, we always had a rivalry was Arkansas, of course. You know, that's when they won the two nationals. And we felt like we were the team to beat them. Uh, that was some great games and great rivalries. Um, man, I think I think one of the greatest ones was like, I think my senior year, we were playing uh, Louisville and uh, Larry Finch was going through some contract disputes or whatever and everything was going crazy. And we weren't having the greatest year anyway, but we just kind of band together. You know, we didn't lose at home. And in the last game, it was like, hey, we win this game. We might go to the NIT, whatever, whatever. And we play some of the best basketball. I mean, it was so much fun uh, doing that doing that thing. I mean, but we had so many highlights. I mean, I can't even hardly just put one in a bubble, you know, because we had so many great times uh, at the University of Memphis, especially at home. You know, it was it was like, you know, Bob Huggins coming with Cincinnati. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> we, 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 the, the, uh, the cheering section, right, used to sit behind, especially the student section, used to sit behind the coaches bench on the opposing coach so every time we scored a bucket they just throwing confetti all across the team and everything crazy so i mean like that's that's college basketball for you though you know that's that's what you really miss about the fans being in a college game is those moments like that and uh you know like i said i mean i had some some great times and great moments and uh i i loved all of them man i, mean, I can't even pick one out one out of hand but of course it's always going to be the one that that hurts the worst is when we got beat by Arkansas in the Sweet 16. Mm. Uh, if we feel like if we win this game, we the national champions that year. So that's the, about the greatest pain we felt as far as, as a team. So, How was it being a part of the big dance? Like a lot of players don't even get that chance to play in the NCAA tourney, March Madness. How was it to play in it? And you played in it twice. Yeah, it was it was it was fantastic, man. I mean, it was just like, you know, introducing you to this is the professional side of the game now, you know, because you got all this media coming and you got questions and these bright lights are on you and 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 everybody is like, you know, it's like, hey, win or go home attitude, you know. So that was like the craziest part about it, and it was so much fun because it was so intense because we knew everything was always going to be magnified. You know, you throw the ball away. Oh my God, you turn turtle. You know, so it can only have like your first turnover in like 20 minutes or something like, oh, you turn it over, you know, but if you make a big shot, it was just so emotional. I mean, who then as a kid growing up wanted to be a part of that last song, you know, that that last song, that moment song. I was like, oh, even though we lost a couple of times, but we was watching it just to watch and say, OK, yeah, we made it. Yeah, we got our cut in there, you know. So it was just a great overall experience, man. You know, and then we got to, I got to meet some, you know, like some celebrities at the time too, you know, cause they were, you know, fans coming in like Woody Harrison uh, oh. used to come, come to the games, you know? And uh, I think uh, I forget the lady who was at Kentucky. Um, she was there. To, yes. That's, yes. You are already see that. Look at you, that boy on his thing right there. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you get to meet, you know, you can, you can meet all these superstars, you know, and uh, you know, it's crazy, you know, and it, it's just like a, it's like a you know introduction to the to the professional world of basketball you know for these guys for for us period you know that's and and then you got to think at that time the nation gets to see who you are you know mm-hmm. you know you know your neighborhood you know Tennessee Mississippi you know they knew who Memphis was but then you get to go see California they get to say man who is this team right here you know so it was a great great experience. That's, that's incredible. I mean, I, you can you can only imagine. You've done a lot of things, a lot of amazing things that, again, I I, I love having guests on that played in the league, obviously. I didn't – I never, ever thought I'd be talking to people who played in the league. Like, it's a wild. <laughs> person who dreamed about playing in the league and didn't get there, it's incredible. Obviously, it's incredible to talk to people who did it. So, um, you know, fast-forwarding to the NBA, right? I mean, so many questions. I guess the first one for you would be, um, what was draft night like? Right, I, I, your second round draft pick, like how that all how that all turned out for you? Well, of course, I, I was nervous and excited at the same time, and 
you know, just being around family at the time and, and didn't know like what was going to happen. You know, I mean, we had ideals, but you just didn't know. You know, I knew I wasn't a first round draft pick, but I had I went to man. I mean, I probably went to 25 workouts because I was like, hey, they call. I'm going, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And because um, I wanted it, you know, and and just being there that night, I didn't know what was to happen. I mean, it was to the point that like I was just like, you, you can see the nervousness in my face and you know, you're trying to play it cool, you know. <laughs> Every time a phone ring, you who, who's that? Who's that? You know, <laughs> I'm just being honest. You know, you just it's like, you know, and, and that's what it, that's what it was. But man, when I got the call, I mean, tears of joy. You know, uh, it was a big accomplishment. You know, it was just, you know, to see your family so proud of you. You know, especially your moms and pops and sister and all those. They were just so happy for me and. It was just crazy, you know, um, that night. So I, and, and, and people was like, what did you do? I said, well, I stayed at home and asked for my mom's cooking. You know, that's it. That was my celebration. Just, just, I, I mean, she made my favorite meal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had my favorite dessert and a big glass of Kool-Aid. And that was, that was my highlight. And it was because it was, I was just so relieved to say, hey, I can, I got a chance to go play. And like you said, it's, it's only about what, like you said, that 0.99% they get an opportunity to even try to say they played it. And so it was just a, a great point. And then the next day, uh, she was like, what are you going to go do? I was like, I'm going to the gym. I'm going to go work out. Like, it was, I was like, I just got on a mission because I wanted to play so bad. Yeah. So the work, they say the work always starts when you when you get drafted. That's where it all starts, right? I mean, Oh, for sure. You know, to play at that yeah. level. Yeah, I mean, like, like you got to know as a second round draft pick, you're not guaranteed like those first rounders. You know, those guys get like a little bit more opportunity. And this is, and this is the truth about the game. You know, people don't understand it. Like, usually those probably top twenty picks, probably the only ones going to really probably play. Mm-hmm. You know, you get lucky about some second rounders. You know, you might find a Draymond Green who just ended up having a great career. So he was a second round guy, but he ended up got the right team, got the right fit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it happens, you know, I, I had to be, you know, patient about when I first came into it. I mean, I was just I had to be patient about what was going as far as playing time, just making a roster. You know, there's a lot of narrow record things, but I was making sure, hey, it's not going to be because I'm not a shape. That's not going to be the reason why I don't make this team. So going through that process, you went to 25 different workouts. <laughs> Did you think that the Cavs was going to be the team that drafted you? No, I really did. I really thought Seattle was going to get me because I, I ended up working out for them more than twice. I, you know, I went to the first one, then they came back and gave me to the second one. But, you know, when I went to the Cavs workout, it was the easiest workout I ever had in my life. I was like, oh, shit. I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm not sorry. But like, he was like, this is the bomb right here. Like, okay. Like, well, they not going to pick me. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you, know how you, you know how you go somewhere, you you, win, you know, you, you like, like, they finna dog you out in this workout, make you run, make you do all this crazy stuff. And they were just like, all right, let's go do the layup drills. All right, shoot a couple jump shots. All right, all right, everybody go home. I'm like, what? Like, we're not going to play? Like, what's going on? It was it was that easy. So I I really didn't have the idea. I mean, I thought it was going to either be Seattle. Um, I thought it was going to be Utah. And um, I want to say Phoenix at the time that I thought I was going to probably – get a chance to be around, but you know, hey, things happen, the weirdest things happen, I'm not mad at it. Wayne Emery is one of the greatest guys i ever met in my life, so I tell him thank you every time I see him. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Me. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. I've never heard that story where it was layups, a couple of jump shots, and yeah. that was it. I'm, and that was it. I mean, like, literally, that was the workout. Like, I tell people that story all the time, they be like, no, and I was like, yo, dude, that was it. Cause like you know, you, when when you go to workouts, you 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 like okay, I make sure I got my breakfast in, got my fluids on me, I'm full, all right, I'm ready to work. Next thing you know, it's like all right, we out of here. I'm like, oh, this is like thirty minutes. Like what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy, but hey, great place. I ended up just being there for four or five years. So yeah, and, and within those four or five years, and especially that first year, right, like. Rookie year is a year you probably never you never forget. I have to imagine, right? That first year in the league. What was that welcome to NBA moment for you? Well, this is when I knew I was in the NBA. All right, we were playing uh, Minnesota in our preseason game, right? 
And Kevin Garnett was like, you know, he's a man, right? You know, Starberry, all that, that watch the Tom Goon, y'all, right? So coach looks at me and says, all right, you got Kevin Garnett. I'm like, yo, what? Like, bro, dude, seven feet tall. I'm like, I'm not guarding him. I'm like, you, you, you making a mistake. He's like, no, you got Kevin Garnett. So I got out there. I'm like, you know, I'm like excited, whatever. And he gets the ball, you know, and he makes one hard jab. I kind of dipped that way. And, and you know, usually in college you can kind of recover, you know, <laughs> you recover back. But then he's seven feet. <laughs> he took off. And I was like, oh, snap. Like, yo, and he, he dunked that ball so hard. I was like, yeah, this is the NBA for real, for real. Now, <laughs> like, this is not – and, and 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 that's that's the part people don't understand, like how talented mm. every person on that roster. I, I'm talking about to the last dude on the bench, how talented every person is on that roster um, in the NBA is. So that was my like, hey, I got to bring my game day. But then the, the coolest part was when we played in New Jersey, and uh, we were playing New Jersey, and I got on the floor, and. Um, I made a move and I, I dunked the ball. I was like, uh-oh, uh-oh, hey, that was kind of fun. So the next play, <laughs> I didn't care what was going on. I'm trying to dunk this thing again. And that's kind of like, hey, you know, I'm in the NBA. I had to get, you know, get over the, you know, the, the, the lights, the cameras and who I'm playing, you know. But my, my greatest moment, though, was when we played Chicago the first time, right? Come on, man, this is, this is Michael Jordan we're playing against right here, right? Oh, you know, I'm like a little kid. Yo, Mike. <laughs> Yo, Mike, can I get your autograph? <laughs> I wouldn't study none of that stuff, man. I'm like, your autograph. Mike looked at me like, what? I was like, yeah, I want your autograph after the game, bro. <laughs> like, I turned into a straight groupie. <laughs> but, hey, it's Mike. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, hey, all right, I'm this is Mike. So, but that was, that was fun. I mean, and it was cool. Now, this is a a unique situation that happened in Cleveland. And it was me, Brevin, Derek Anderson, four rookies. So we all played as rookies. And it was cool to do that together because, you know, sometimes you can be the lonely rookie on the team. But when you got four four rookies going through the same experience, it was kind of cool to grow up with those guys. Yeah. Yeah, how was that too, that rookie year? Uh, we asked Brevin this because just looking at that rookie year, Nobody expected Cleveland to make the playoffs that year. Sean Kemp was sitting over there. they like, oh, it's just going to be Sean Kemp and these young boys. They're not going to get in the playoffs. They'll probably be in the lottery, drafting another. Right. And y'all guys shocked the whole NBA. Like, So how was that? Your rookie year, you come right into the NBA and you in the playoffs. Man, listen, we – Mike Fratello was one of the greatest – at motivating guys to get more out of what we were doing, you know, like we did, you know, like he squeezed, you know, every ounce of talent we had. Uh, Shadronis was unbelievable. Derek was unbelievable. Brevin was unbelievable. But then to add it with Sean, you know, we had to learn fast. You know, it was like learn fast, you know. And um, when we had Wesley Person, who was, you know, another veteran shooter we had. And then and it, we bought into it. Mike had, you know, bought into this – rotation of playing like eight to ten guys and and it worked and it worked and we and we just kept believing it. we kept we, what the biggest thing we did was just kind of turn that noise out we won paying attention to about we, hey we rookies and all this and all that it's like hey man we got to play and um we all had something to prove you know uh, and it was just a great experience that that first year i mean sean had an unbelievable year you know he was all-star that year uh he, he came ready to play because he had something to prove himself because i think Coming from Seattle, you know, he was demanding the big contract, and he's like, oh, he don't deserve it. So he had a chip on his shoulder, too. And then to take four guys under our wings and, and turn that thing around and get in the playoffs was so big for us. But, you know, you can't you can't fathom that we were going to do that that year. But we did, and then we, we still take credit for that one. That, that's incredible. I mean, and, and hearing Brevin run through that year and you run through that year, you know, it's incredible to do that as rookies. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen often. Like you mentioned, no. it's not something that you just walk in the league and experience. Um, how did playing with John Kemp raise your game, right? Like, what did you – especially being a forward, right? Like, right. right. 
you probably were guarding them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, well, what what happened was, you know, it was a blessing to have a guy who drew double teams. You know, mm-hmm. you know, to have an all star. So it, it was like, okay, we got to help him out. We got to be able to make open shots. We got to be able to, you know, get the ball to him in certain needs and and do things. And he was, you know, people underestimated how skilled Sean was as far as a post player. You know, they they used to the dunking. They was used to the highlight. But footwork, man, this guy, I mean, he had some stuff with him, man. You know, he knew how to play. And, um, you know, like what we were doing, we were just improving ourselves. We were hungry uh, because we knew that we had a lot of responsibility you know, as rookies, because we didn't know, you know, honestly, we didn't know how much playing time we was going to play. We didn't know if Derrick Anderson was going to be another point guard. We didn't figure out, but we found it. We found a niche. And and Mike Rotella, credit to him and the coaching staff that year, they, and we bought into it. No egos, uh, you know, everybody just buying into their role. You know, I knew I was, when I was out there, I, I knew I was the prime defender. You know, that was my role. I didn't go in there and say, oh, coach, I ain't getting no shots. Didn't even ask for shots sometimes. I, I, I remember playing in Miami, played 42 minutes and took three shots. Jeez. But guess what? I got a win. That's right. So who cared? You know what I'm saying? Nobody looked at that. Oh, he played 42 minutes to take a shot. No, he played 42 minutes and got a win that night. So, you know, it was, it was it's hard to put aside egos sometimes at that level. Let's be realistic. You know, we, we see it every day, even with some of the superstars, you know, we see it. But if, you, the, if you're willing to sacrifice to win, that's that what makes you a great team to understand this is your job. This is your job. I mean, like when you're going to play with like, say, we're just going to use LeBron. Like, if you notice LeBron I always say, oh, this is not my team. What do you always say? You know, man, it's Anthony Davis team. He mm-hmm. know what he playing. But everybody know who, who team it is. But we're going to make sure he, he's happy because that's his role. And everybody else just got to play their position. And that's what makes great teams good. Yeah. So you mentioned that. I just want to ask, where did that mentality come from? Because I'm sure, especially as a coach, you see it in this generation. 42 minutes, three shots, and a win in this generation. Yo, you trash. You ain't getting no buckets. <laughs> <laughs> where did that mentality come from for you? Like, First of all, you got to know who you are and what. That's your job. You know, you got to accept that. I knew who I was. I knew I was the defender. I knew I had to do things and maybe sacrifice a lot of things that I could. But I knew the next night I might get 20 shots and, and hit 20 points, you know. So it wasn't about that. It was about the win more than it was. Then. And it's and you tell kids all the time, like, I take if you want to award, say you want to be on a first team or a second team or whatever, the losing team, that guy can average, say you got the losing team, right? He can average 25, 30 points a night. Why he never makes the first team second team? Why? Because he's not winning. Everybody wants a winner. So that's why you can see I, I tell people always about, I always talk about Shane Battier, mm. the ultimate role player. The ultimate role player. I mean, what he averages, eight points for a whole career in the NBA? But he got yeah. some rings, though, did he? <laughs> so that I mean it's always a job. Uh let's go Bruce Bowen for Sacramento yeah. uh, for San Antonio. Ultimate role. Couldn't all he did was shoot corner threes. But I'm a D up Kobe. I'm gonna get Kobe might hit 50 on me tonight. But I got this ring though. So yeah. I mean it's it's more it's more about maturity. And I think I, I learned that even when I was at Memphis a little bit, because I knew I played with a guy like Lorenzo Wright and David Bond who were real good bigs at the time. So I had to understand that they're going to get their points too. And I have to do whenever I get my chance to get do my part too. And team basketball was always stressed to me, even growing up through high school, through Memphis. And so when I got to the NBA, it was rare, but it was great that, like I said, we had four rookies and those guys came from winning programs. So they understood the importance of doing what you're supposed to do, you know, it's hard to sell that these days because, like you said, man, you, you, you man, 42 minutes, you don't shoot. You got to be mature enough to know that 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 is not important because I'm getting these wins. So, you know, that's that's the hard part about it. But it took a while to accept it when I was kind of coming up and I had to figure out what I did well. I knew I was a great finisher, a great defender and had a decent mid range jump shot. So I just made sure I kept my strength strong. And whatever I needed to work on, I tried to work on during the offseason. But 
my strong points, I make sure I do that every night. That's a common thing that we hear. Every guest that we had that actually played at a high level, whatever sport, they say the key to success for the teams and individual players is knowing your role and playing your role. Every guest, it comes up somewhere <laughs> in their response at some point. Yo, it's just about knowing your role, man. Oh, it's just about knowing your role. Play your role. Every yeah. guest. Exactly. You can't have a lot of Chiefs on the team, right? No, nope. no. Nope. You know what I'm saying? You can't have a lot of Chiefs. Yeah. You got to have, you know, got to have some foot soldiers sometimes, you know, and those are, they don't, and they got to understand they just are in more important just as the Chiefs on the team. Yep. You know, that's one thing I do give credit to a guy like Tom Brady. I tell, we were talking about this. I know I'm bringing up wounds over there to that guy, but Tom Brady for years used to sacrifice his contract to keep players around him. That's a winner right there. Hey, man, listen, I know I get that money back. You know, I mean, most guys won't do that because, like you said, you can, but he was like, hey, I'm trying to do something bigger than, I mean, like, dude, he got the most Super Bowl wins over any franchise in the NFL now. You think he going to ever worry about a check? No, never. You know, so it worked out for him. So that's the team, the ultimate sacrifice for, for it as a teammate to understand that, uh, you know, I got to think bigger than myself. If you got team, if you got a team and guys thinking that way, you got something special. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. You, you, that's a that's a winner, and it takes a certain mentality to be a winner. But and you know, you talked about the development of that mentality and how how you were able to get that through playing in the NBA too, right? But how has that affected your philosophy when it comes to recruiting players now, right? Bringing it back to right now. Well, you know, you try to look for good character guys. Uh, and again, I recruit when I go look at kids. I, I look at kids who understand their, you know on a good team. I go, first of all, I'm like, okay, what's your team record? You're, okay, you 24 and five. Okay, I'm going to watch and see what this team is about, mm-hmm. you know, and I watch what they're about because if that guy understands that he's doing his job, that's, that's going to help me out. He knows what basketball is about. You know what I'm saying? Then if I can see him being competitive and unselfish, and what I mean by unselfish, I'm running the floor because I'm supposed to run the floor. I'm not running it because I, I think I'm going to get the ball. And I'm running it every time because this is what I'm supposed to do. Man, that, that right there just took it up two more notches, you know. And then let's be honest, if he got a skill set, that just – that's the cake. You know what I'm saying? And that's what makes the difference between who he is. And uh, so it, it, it comes to that point. And, and you got to know that kids do feel that way. Like every kid, especially at the love I am – Every kid wants to be D1. Everybody wants to go to the big school. And it's hard to come in there and say, hey, look, maybe you need to come here. This is where you're at. And that becomes a pride thing. So you got to know how to talk to these kids in that situation because you don't want to break their ego in a sense. But at the same time, you want them to understand reality. This is, might be where you need to be at. And then I can say, hey, I can help you get to where you maybe want to go. You know, And that's hard to sell sometimes, but, yeah. you know, that's what I have to sell, you know, and then dealing with these young kids today, you know, you deal with, you know, let's be realistic, you got mom, pop, uncle, brother, Twitter, Facebook, social media, telling them they're the greatest since Kool-Aid. But the reality is he just may be the average. And mm-hmm. sometimes they can't accept that. You know, that's the tough part about it. But you try to teach kids, you try to be as positive as you can when you're approaching these young men and and hopefully you got the ones that are good kids, you know, and um, and it's rare when you find those kids, you know, some of them, you know, they kind of like, ah, oh, you might see them two years from now and you might get them then. But most of the time it's, you know, you, you, you pick them out, you see what kind of, you know, first thing I want to know is what kind of character he has. You know, I try to tell these young men, be careful with social media because that's, you know, the first thing I want is, I mean, I'm like, the, I'm like your job application now. I want your social media page. <laughs> They're like, oh, why you want that? I just want, want it. Let me have it. I might sit sit there for 30 minutes and just watch and see what you got going on because that's what they're doing. You know, you, you, you put your life on this social media and the wrong thing get out there. I might say, okay, I can't deal with that kid. This is what he doing in his free time. And that hurts him. You know, I try to warn these kids about that stuff. And and because and, the coach don't want to have to worry about off field things, you know, I should, I should trust you to go to class. I should trust you to do the right things in, in, in the public. 
and, and, and you know, when you're in your private time, just make sure it's your private time. And that's what I try to stress. But recruiting these young men, you try to you try to get quality guys. It's hard, but you try to. Yeah. No, I mean, it's like you put the quality, the, the quality of the of the man, of the of the young man. Right. And the skill set and the kind of player they are, because obviously, right, they're representing the brand, they're representing you in school. So it's, it's, a, it's a bigger deal there. And I think that's illuminating because we have a lot of younger listeners and uh, people that tune into the show that want to play at a high level, right, and want to know what it takes to play. And what coach is looking for, and they come in that in those stands and watch them play basketball, and so that's that's really illuminating for them, for sure. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said, we know the stats. We're gonna see the stats first, anyway. Mm-hmm. But now, what's gonna separate you from the two hundred thousand kids who play your same position uh. that I'm wanting to invest in you um, to come to my school? I mean, you know, that's one thing they gotta understand. It's this is. It's just like you guys trying to, you know, sell marketing or whatever. Y'all got co- competitors, you know, what's going to what's going to separate your your show to the next show. So same thing with basketball. I, I mean, I'm going to look at 25 guards in one day, probably. But what's going to separate you from these 25 people I'm looking at, you know, when I'm doing this job interview <laughs> basically with you. So, you know, those are the things you got to think about, you know, when, you, when you're approaching it, approaching that way. So, you know, a lot of guys don't. They get engulfed into the just what they know what's around them. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the best player right here. Okay, but it's this ocean thing out here. <laughs> it's some whales and sharks and it's some big people things out here. Uh, you think you're ready for that? You know, and, and that's the reality, the reality of it all. Transitioning back to your career, right? So – how did you end up going overseas? What was that process um, of choosing to go overseas? Well, you know, I, I played in a couple of training camps, you know, and it's tough. You know, when you get started playing in training camps, you, you know, you pray you can get on that roster. Um, and at that time, it wasn't the, the G League or anything to fall, fall back to. You, you understand what I'm saying? So the next best option was going overseas and you had to make sure you played in the FIBA sanctioned leagues over there. Um, it was different, um, but it was, it wasn't bad. It was very, very eye opening to see different cultures, different cities, different things. Um, but when I went over there, I had a great time. I mean, I wasn't bad at it. Uh, played in some great leagues, had some great times and, you know, it was a little stress, a little, a little easier on the body to be honest with you. It was like playing college again. Yeah. You know, you just playing on Tuesday and Friday. Oh, man, I got you. Bro. I mean, you know, and people don't understand, man, you play in the NBA, man, you might play four games in one week. Then the next week, you got another three, four games, and then you're traveling all over the place. So it's kind of tough. But um, going overseas was something that, you know, I mean, I wanted to continue to play basketball. I felt like I still had basketball in my life, and I wanted to get, continue to play it. Um, so that's what I chose to do. I didn't want to go play in the CBA, kind of grind it around. You know, everybody wants to earn money too, you know. Um, so that's why I chose to go do that so I can get the best bang for the value of what I thought I could offer. So that's why I went over there to play. And then the NBDL came back. So I used to play overseas a little bit and finish off in the NBDL and try to see if I get a 10 day or something like that. I mean that's that's incredible. And when you talk about playing overseas and the difference in the, the game, it's, it's not even just like the the level the level of play. That will play is incredibly high everywhere. I think people kind of take that for granted, right? But this is oh, different yeah. style, right? With the style I know now is different. You know, when I watch European basketball versus basketball in the league, it, there's some more similarities now. But I think even ten years ago, those guys were out there heaving up threes before the NBA. Hey, hey, look, look here. Listen, my first game. I'm like looking at this dude. I'm like, oh, he a post player. It's like, oh no, he a shooter. I'm like, dude, he's seven feet. He's like, no, he a shooter. Right. I'm like, what? It you know, and that's bad. that's when you realize, like, okay, this is a different game. You know what I'm saying? And and the three ball, like, that's when I really got introduced to the transition three ball when I was overseas because it was so big. Like we, we used to practice. We used to we used to play. You know, say we just playing three on two drill, whatever. And I'm used to with three on two drill. I'm trying to get to the cup, you know, do whatever, get a finger roll. He's like, oh no, 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 no. Run to the corner, shoot the three. He's like, for real? He's like, that's what we do. He's like, we run to the corner and shoot the three. And that's what we started doing. And then before you knew it, I was I mean, I was taking like six threes to seven threes a game just in transition. Yep. 
they were pace and facing before that even came to the NBA. That was the thing there first. And it's so yes. crazy that even like years and years and years ago, they were starting that. Their big men are so skilled and it's, it, there's a heavy emphasis on the skill part of their game out there, right? And so I, yeah. I always try to give European players that love because it, it's it's truly remarkable um, the, how they develop their young talent. Like a guy like Luka Doncic who comes to the NBA as a rookie, that guy was not a rookie. <laughs> no, he been playing that- pro ball for five years. <laughs> like, like he was like, oh, he was a rookie. I was like, no, no, man. But him doing what he did, it was no. It came as no surprise. People who came to who watched him, and I watched a couple of his clips. Just like I was curious who he was, and everyone was talking about him in the draft process. And seeing his his bag was deep, and it, it was it was crazy. Yeah, talking about teenager, not everything. Right, and, and see, that's another thing. I think that was a, a big advantage for some people overseas too. You know, you we had. I remember having a seventeen year old guy on my on my pro league team playing with me. Like this kid was seventeen, and you know, here I am about thirty three, thirty four, and he's. I'm like, you seventeen? He's like, yeah. I was like, okay. Like, and that's what they did. They played him young, and I think that that was kind of the curve that we as Americans didn't do. I, I think y'all. I, I mean, do y'all remember when was it Carlos the Spain team beat the USA team yeah. in one year? Yeah. You remember that, right? And people's like, they were so shocked. And I was like, I wasn't even shocked at it because of the skill set those guys were playing. Like you said, they wasn't used to that. And you got to think the rules were a little different. Mm-hmm. I mean, not the rules were different, different, but the style of play was different. We, they, mm-hmm. And they were ready for whatever, you know, to do. So it, it, it wasn't shocking because like overseas basketball, uh, people don't realize like Mike D'Antonio had been coaching over there for years yep. before he even came to the NBA. And they was like, oh, where you come with this crazy? It's like, dude, he been doing and he won championships with it though. Yep. People don't realize that. Yep. Pace and pace. It, it shot within the first seven first seven seconds of the shot clock. All that yes. stuff over here. He just he just brought it here. And and exactly. that Phoenix team had a lot of success. They didn't win a championship, but they had a lot of success. With it. Exactly. Exactly. It made Steve Nash win two MVPs though. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. <laughs> Stan Tony. You know? D'Antoni, why that goes to D'Antoni in the way that he learned exactly. before. Yeah, and something so you definitely, mentioned. Definitely open. Say and again? Something, yeah, something you mentioned too with the, the 17 year old playing. That just reminds me of Kobe and his documentary, how he came to that decision to go to the league. He's like, if I really want to be the best, why not go play with the best and learn from them? And they do right. that overseas. Hey, if this this is what you want to do, this is your career, then go start it. 17, exactly. 16, go play with these grown men, get better, learn the game. And then if they want to go to America, by the time a Luca comes over at 21, that joke was a seasoned vet, basically. He basically was. Exactly right. You're 100% right. I mean, like, that's a big advantage. That is a big advantage. That's why, you, you know, you see those guys take off so fast when they get here. You know, they, they just – they ready to play right away. Um, I mean, if you see the, the increase in numbers in the overseas players now, I mean, like, you know, when I first came to the league, you know, it was probably, you know, at three, four, five percent. I mean, I think that has jumped up about 20 percent now, maybe more. You know, it's just some, it's some names out there. I'd be like, OK, how you pronounce that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's, there's some guys who just snuck over here, man. And people don't pay attention to, you know, that, that they know. And like I said, the world is so connected now, especially with the Internet, with what's going on. Scouts are able to see way more players than what they were able to see back in our days to, because of what's going on. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, the Chinese league that, that uh, Yao Ming started over there is mm-hmm. huge. I mean, it's, it is, it's phenomenal. Like, it's, it's like the baby NBA, you know, for guys. I and mean, you get guys who would get another contract because they played in this league and come back to America and play in the NBA again. So, it, it, overseas basketball is, is – it's one of the best, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I'm not going to take it away from them. I, mean, I still going to cheer for my American basketball, but oh, yeah. you know, you got to give them props for where props at because they have changed the game. They changed the game to allow the three ball to be shot by the center. I mean, yeah. one too many games you're going to see Shaq come down and pull up a tray ball, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but in today's game, you never know. You never know. Shaq maybe would have tried one this year, you know, if he was playing in today's game. You never know, you know. I mean, look at Jewel and B. We, they have to beg him to go post up now. You know, I'm glad Doc <laughs> Rivers is making him do it, but, you know, but that's crazy to think about, though. I mean, you see his game. He's shooting threes. He's facing up. He's spinning off people. You know, it's a whole different ball game now. Yep. And another thing is the high school you're, you're seeing now with the high school players and, and 
you know, the, the most the biggest example is LaMelo Ball, you know, taking that route going to, from high school to overseas, then to the league. I think right. that's the reason that we feel a lot more. because I, and, and you see the maturity, the way his game's matured from when he was a freshman at Chino Hills, jacking up threes left and right, right? And people right. knew he was good, but knew he was talented, but didn't take him that seriously. And now the growth of the game, like, I, I think I, I give a lot of credit to his time overseas. I think it forced him to grow up. Like and and some can't handle that, but I think it's you're gonna start. We're gonna start seeing a lot more of it. So I mean, I, I don't know what your take is on that, but as a college coach, right, losing some of this talent that overseas pipeline. Yeah, I mean, like you know, it, it's 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 scary. I mean, I think the NBA woke up to it. I mean, I don't know if y'all paid attention, but with Jalen Green, what he do? He, he signed a contract to go play in the G League, G League, you know, instead of going to prep school or anything. So the NBA is catching on to what's going on. It's like, hey, let's not let our talent go over here. Let's mm-hmm. groom them ourselves and mm-hmm. let's just make this team. And, and that's a big step forward into yeah. the direction of what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? So instead of, you know, Lamar Ball going to play in Australia, he would have been playing for this G League team and getting groomed and getting ready to go play in the NBA. Uh, I think they're catching on to all those things, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a very concept, you know, because let's be honest, man. Like, yeah, do you want a kid to get groomed? Do you think some of these young men are not ready for it? Yeah, it's not even – I only think it's more about the skills. It's just more about what's going on with the NBA, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying, the wear and tear, the immaturity of what they might do with their free time, you know, things like that. They're going to teach them how to be a professional. That's yep. the biggest thing. And and people are like, well, you know, that's easy. No, it's not. It's not as easy as you think it is, you know. Um, let me give you $100 million and then say go do what you want to do. Might do some crazy things, you know, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that's a smart move on them to to keep our talent here and groom them and let them play against these G League guys who are got some veteran guys on the team and they get the experience and if they're good enough, they just you know like I think Jalen Green will probably be a top five pick next year in the NBA draft, yes, you know, easily. Yes, you know, yes, sir. I totally so agree. I mean, it's, it's just smart. Yeah, I mean, so why let them go play in Australia? <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, and it's also smart from a business perspective for the NBA. It's equitable for them. The G League's going to be must see TV. I'm going to watch G League games this year because Jim right. Green, um, Isaiah Todd, uh, Precious. Yeah. Uh, I'm forgetting his name, man. He's he's from just oh Jonathan Kaminga. He's in. Mm-hmm. These guys are all going to be playing on one team, so I'm going to tune in. And, and so yeah, it's it's brilliant on their end because they're making their, their another. Another branch of their business equitable. Well, I mean, but the way you think about baseball, they've been doing it for years. Farm leagues. You you got single A, triple A, double A, you name it. Then you know, like, who is this dude pitching right here? Where he come from? Oh, he's been there. He's been in this farm league for 10 years. You just didn't never know about him. So I think it's a smart move. I think it keeps our, keeps the talent here and keeps it, it makes the NBA better. Because let's be honest, because at one point in time, everybody was like, oh, the NBA is not that fun to watch regular season. But now they're getting better. I mean, you see the skill set getting better. You see the games getting better. You see the intensity getting better. It's more value in the game uh, than it was, once was, you know. And you have to appreciate what they're doing to make it a better game. So now these young talent guys won't fizz out in a year or two. They'll probably stay now eight, nine, ten years, you know. Yep. All right, last, last one before we transition. We thank you again for hopping on with us. One piece of advice you give to a young player trying to play at that D1, D2, D3, just trying to play in college, what's one piece of advice you'd give them? Well, the best advice I always say, um, a great player will do all things that's necessary. And that means the school work, the hard work, because the basketball is the easy work. Um, you have to be able to willing to sacrifice some things, you know, Hey, I can't go to the party this Friday. You know, um, I got to work out because I got some, I got a big game coming up and things and just being, and being humble a little bit, you know, being, being humble about yourself, being a meek person, uh, trying to have high character that helps a whole lot, you know, and also just enjoying the game as much as possible and play the game. And, you know, all things come in due time. You know, I think, in today's society, we're a microwave society. We want it right now. Mm-hmm. I think we should take time and just enjoy the growth and the process. And when you're able to do that, I think that helps a whole lot because everybody's path is different. You know, everybody's path is different. So you have to be real, real with yourself and see where you're at. I can definitely say that's something that you can use across the board, the enjoying the process, that the journey 
is the part that's actually the enjoyment, not getting to the mountaintop. How you right. get there is so important. And I, I can speak for me and our generation. We focus so much on that end goal and totally take for granted all the things that's happening leading up to that. And you don't even appreciate it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And just enjoy. Like, I appreciate now I'm, I'm I guess I'm a real older now so <laughs> I appreciate a lot of more things you know the simple things I mean even playing overseas made me appreciate even more about a lot of more different things in life you know uh just spending time with families and friends and kids and all that stuff so and now I get to I, you know the the cool part is I get to pass it on to my son that's that's been a real good joy um you know he'll call with some frustration things something nice and I'll be like hey hey listen 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 Calm down. Let's 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 deep breath. Let's let's watch the game. Let's come together and see what you're talking about. You know, and that's the maturity. I I hope I can give the solid advice I can give them uh, about it. You know, because you know we do tend to, like I said, want it right now. Oh, I want it right now, and you, you know you just have to enjoy, like I say, enjoy the moment because you're never gonna. I think the best time for any young man is really college. I really do. I think it's the best time. So I'm not knocking guys who can go play straight to the NBA. I'm, I really am not. I hope they can do that. But if I'm a young man and I have the opportunity to experience college life, like I was so proud of what Zion did because he got the chance to experience college life. And he was he's going to appreciate that when he's older. I mean, he's really going to be like, yo, I had a great time playing at Duke. And that's that was the thing people got to understand. College life is very important. I think it's to me is very important because it, you're trying to find out who you are as a person. And that's when you really find out who you are as a person, I think, during college. Yeah, that's something key. Uh, we're going transition, but mentioning Kobe again, he mentioned that rookie year, he would drive past UCLA like, yo, should I have gone to college? Should I have done this? Especially right. when you get to the, when you get into the league, a lot of times the rookies don't get that same amount of playing time or that they're not the man on that team. So it's a very, it's it's a learning process. It's a learning curve. There's very few players that you have. That's like LeBron from day one. Here's the keys. Exactly. Exactly. Even Kobe didn't get the keys from day one. I tell people that all the time. I say, y'all do realize Kobe was coming off the bench in his first year, right? I know he wasn't. I was like, yes. Some of these guys don't really do their history when they talk basketball. So I just go like, oh, they don't know Mm -hmm. better. (laughs) I know. We, we I was like, like they, what I know. They, <laughs> they just like they don't know that. I just go like, all right. But you know, <laughs> but yeah, like you said, that that, that those those it's a, it's a blessing to be able to play. Like I tell people all the time, it's like my, the first twenty five games, I was sitting on the sideline, you know. And when they called my name, I was just ready to play. And it just happened to be that I did well enough to get to the start point, you know. Yeah. Transitioning to our with the quickness segment some rapid fire questions, whatever comes to your mind. First one, what's your go-to meal? My go-to meal? Oh my God, fried chicken, collard greens, and yams. You know, I'm a country boy. (laughs) You can't go wrong with that. And that's a perfect transition to the next question, Greg. I haven't even had dinner yet, so that made my mouth water a little bit. Um, (laughs) But (laughs) the the, uh, my next question is: I told I'm, Have you had the Popeyes chicken sandwich yet? Out of curiosity, I uh, know I try to stay away from fast food. I have not tried the Popeyes, right. and I and I didn't understand why people was going crazy. I was like, dude, it's chicken on bread, yo. Like, are y'all serious? Like, my mama chicken better than that. <laughs> yeah, first of all, you're right. You're right. <laughs> you're, I have not you're, tried. You're definitely right. Your mom, your mom's food's always better. I, I, I I'm your smart yeah. man, sensible man. Let me tell you something though. That, that chicken sandwich is magic. It's fire. It's fire, huh? I need to try. <laughs> it's, it's See, you gotta think. At, at my age, man, we're trying to stay young, man. So we got we can't eat that no more. I remember, I remember I used to eat a pizza, and it wouldn't bother me at all. I eat one slice now. It's, it's gonna be problems at night. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, oh my god, like how did that? Oh my, am I dying? You know? <laughs> nah, smart. My pops be going through that sometimes himself. <laughs> yeah, you got to watch what we eat, man. We ain't, we ain't got the same stomach, man. You gotta yeah, watch I, re- I remember one time my pops cooked spaghetti, 
And he started adding sugar. I'm like, yo, what you adding sugar to it for? That's for the heartburn. I said, oh, no. Nah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Hey, hey, he know you. I like your pops. He know what's up. <laughs> <laughs> he know what's up. Oh, man. Next one. So what type of music do you listen to? Like, what's your favorite artist that you listen to now? Well, you know, I'm still old school, man. I'm still like a, you know, 90s, 80s baby rap guy. So I listen to a lot of that. But today's music, though, I know how I'm, I've been. I've been on that J Cole guy. You know, I like J Cole. Um, I kind of like him. I, mean, I can't get with these young cats too much, but I have to listen to it so I can know what the hell's going on because the team is listening to it. So I guess I. I guess I don't know. I uh, see. So we we're around here. I guess it's uh, Money Bag Yo. Is that one of the guys' names? So I like him. He's from Memphis. So you know, I, I rock with Money Bag Yo. We just you know, talked about him last night. No. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Money Bag Yo. Go. He gonna get it. You know. So. There it is, you know. I, I know his music, and I'm a young dog. Okay, now I, I will. I know who Young Dolph is. So I do like Young Dolph. Okay, uh, I, like I, right. I like his song. Yeah, yeah, I'm from right. Tennessee, man. Tennessee, on, man. Yeah, I'm gonna represent that Memphis, man. You know, all day, every day. <laughs> you know, when fun. I when I came when I came into the league, you know, I was listening to number eight ball MJG and three six mafia. You know, it wasn't nothing else playing. <laughs> What was your toughest matchup in the NBA? I'm going to say when Glenn Rice was in Charlotte, mm. he was mm. a beast. He was mm. a beast. I mean, they had a good time. They had Vlade Divac, Anthony Mason. I mean, they had a, they had a squad. And uh, I caught him when he was, like, on his on his game. Like, he can play. Uh, Glenn Rice was a beast. I mean, he, can, he was a 6'8 shooter, you know, just all-around good ball player. Give me some of your favorite – all-time teammates? Oh, uh, man, I'm definitely going to say all the rookies on the Cleveland team, for sure. Um, but when I was over friend, overseas, I played with a guy named Yaya who came from Georgetown, big man. His name was literally Yaya. And uh, he spoke French, spoke French and everything. So he was kind of helping me out when the other guys were speaking a lot of languages. So he was real cool and uh, we were real cool guys. So He's another cool guy that uh, I like. So, and uh, definitely all my Memphis State guys, you know, from the Chris Gone and the Rodney Newsoms and all those guys, you know, we always had that brother love forever. Who's your NBA champion this year? Oh, man, you're going to put me on the spot for real. <laughs> man, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the dog horse again, man. I hope they get it together, man. I'm going to go with Kawhi Leonard and the Clippers, man. Mm. I think Tyro Lu is going to do something to help that team get over that hump. You know, sometimes it, it takes a it takes a move to make things happen better. You know, I mean, they quietly still winning games and playing good basketball. You know, they're not going to get that hype because of what happened last year. But hopefully, Paul George don't become playoff PG ever again. We don't want that guy no more. <laughs> Just be Paul George. <laughs> and I think getting rid of some of those pieces, though. I mean, I think getting rid of, of uh, uh, the big guy who went to the lake, Montrez, Dockley, Montrez. I think that's going to help them. You know, I think, I think it's going to help them in some way. So it's going to let those younger guys who can play a little bit get more have no playing time. So I'm, I'm going to go with the Clippers, Dark Horse. Okay, all right. I'm a Lakers fan, so I'm I'm choosing Lakers in five. Uh, <laughs> I already understand. I, I think LeBron. I think LeBron is is doing a heck of a job. But you know, if Anthony Davis, he'll still keep her y'all y'all in trouble. Uh oh. I've been I've been saying this. LeBron has been playing great, but A D, he's struggling to start off the season so far. Well, you know, he looked a little heavier than he did last year. Maybe it's my TV. I, I'm gonna just say it's my TV. <laughs> <laughs> he got that championship weight. <laughs> hey man, listen, that's real. I'm a, I'm of the mindset that guy's gonna figure it out when it matters, man. He's, yeah, I think player. they will. Yeah, 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 I mean that's they didn't true. get to really celebrate. It, you no, know, he, he didn't. The season, yeah, he, the the yeah. offseason was the shortest one ever. I mean, I, I respect that. I respect that. No. Two more before we get you out of here. Again, we thank you for taking time out. Five people, dead or alive, that you'd like to have a meal with. Oh man, I will definitely like to have a meal with 
first one definitely would be Obama. I would like to speak to him. I think he's a, a great thinker. Uh, you know, just and then things he accomplished would be always so great. Um, I would like to speak to Muhammad Ali just because of all the things he went through. Uh, for some reason, I would like to speak to Malcolm X because, you know, when people really look at his life, he really opened his eyes to a lot of things because he was closed minded in one thing and then he went and researched and learned about what was going on in the world. Uh, and one of my favorites is probably my grandfather. Uh, I really didn't get to know him, so I really want to sit here sit and meet him and have a meal with him. And then uh, last but not least, uh, can't think of that fourth or fifth person. Let's see. Uh, I probably want to sit there and talk to Billy D. Williams. I know that's odd, but that, you know, the era he came out, you know, he was the smoothest dude in the world, you know, that Coke 45 commercial, you know, hey, come on, man. Y'all don't know nothing about that probably, but hey, I probably want to meet him and just talk to him, have a meal with him, see how smooth he is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, my pops told me about Billy D. I, I know yeah. a little bit about Billy D. Yeah, Billy D was a was a. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think he he broke the ground, you know, as far as some of the things he did, as far as acting and and uh-huh. uh, accomplishing. I mean, like when you get into the Empire Strike Back when back then as a black African American actor to get uh-huh. into that type of movie, that was that was pretty pretty big accomplishment. Definitely, I can't argue with that table. That's uh-huh. probably going to be a good table, and your mom cooks. Yeah, it's going to be a good. It's going to be a good night. Oh yeah. For sure, for sure. Everybody gonna be sleep though. You know what I'm saying? They gonna... <laughs> everybody gonna fall asleep out of the meal, you know, because when that peach coffee come with the ice cream, it's over with, bro. Everybody go to sleep. Yeah, it's gonna be that itis. <laughs> Yo, Love it. I'm gonna have to call my mom up now. You just said the peach cobbler. I need, I need hey, that. Listen here, man. I am a grown man. I will still call my mom and say, hey, look, mom, look. I- I'm gonna go buy all the ingredients. Just cook it for me. <laughs> <laughs> my birthday Monday, I'm definitely hitting mom dupes up. Like, hey, for my that peach cobbler, I just need. Yes. That's, that's all I want for my birthday. That's all I need. Thank you. That's all you're going to say. Thank you, mom. And then you're going to oh, be man. selfish. You're going to be worse than me. You're going to be selfish. You're going to be sitting there all by yourself, eating it by yourself. They're like, let me get something. No, nah, I'm straight. No, nah, y'all can't. Oh, no. <laughs> nah. It's been too many birthdays I had to share with the sisters and the note. Not this. Not yes. This year. <laughs> not this year. I understand, man. I understand. Last one. We kind of swagger jack this from another podcast that we listen to. Shout out to all the smoke podcasts, but it's a great question. And for a up and coming podcast like us trying to grow, this is a great question. Who do you think or would like to have as another guest on the Bench Mob podcast? And before you answer, is there any way? whoever comes to your mind that you could give us that connection. Oh, man. Oh, I don't know if I can give it out, but I, I would love to see you do, uh, I'd love to see you do, man, that would be interesting. I would love to see you do Anthony Hardaway, just out of curiosity because of all the, all the things he's going through right now. Kind of answer some weird questions. He has an interesting story. The Kenny Hardaway's like, is that what I heard? Yeah. Oh, oh, well, dream come true. You know what I mean? We would love to NBA guys on here at all. Having like, <laughs> having you and Brevin on? Like, that's We didn't oh, think yeah. that was possible. We didn't think that kind of something. This was possible. So I, I want to thank you, man. Like, for real, you took like an hour and a half out of your, your night to do this. So I, you're a college coach. You're busy. Gotta be breaking down film, you know, and so I, oh, man, I do that all day long. It was, it was it was good and a pleasure to be doing something different, bro. I mean, like, you know, this is what it's all about, man. You know, um, taking time out to do things for people. You know, that's I think that's part of life. I think you giving them giving back to more as much as I can. You know, um, it's it's enjoyable. Y'all y'all seem like some great group of guys. When I saw y'all thing doing with Brevin, I was like, oh, man, they, they seem like some cool little guys, you know, and. Uh, and, and it's cool, you know. It's it's, you know, that's what the world needs right now. We need to be we need to be neighborly. It's right. it's, it's a great word to say, you know. It's nothing nothing personal, nothing bad. It's just being neighborly, just doing nice things for people. Um, and it's been an enjoyable. So, no yeah. problem, man. I really appreciate you guys having me. Cool. Definitely. Um, hey, 
Penny Harlan. We're going to post this clip. If you see this, you are more than welcome to hop on the bench mile. We, we will clear our schedule. Just like all of our guests, we will. if you want to do it on a Saturday at 2 o'clock in the morning, we're available. Trust me, we work around we work around the schedule of our guests, whatever works for them. So you see this one, no wrong with that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we do. We'll, we'll pass, pass it forward. How about that? Appreciate that. But this is the end of this episode. There was a lot of gems, a lot of wisdom in this episode, a lot of good advice, great clips that we're going to be able to use. We, again, thank you for hopping on. But you guys know the vibes. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Bench mob, we out. Peace. Peace. Now you guys take it easy.